Well, good morning and welcome to our live stream service this morning uh, from our house to yours. Uh, I don't know what you've done with the extra half an hour you might have had in bed this morning. You might still be there, I don't know. Um, but wh whoever you are, if you're part of our church family or maybe you just happen to be watching into this, you're really welcome. And um, we're praying that this morning is going to go without technical glitch. But if for any reason you lose us at any point, don't worry, we're going to be uploading the whole service online later on. We've also on our YouTube channel got a uh, playlist, a lighthouse online. So if you've got children, um, you've got children up to the age of 11, then please connect them in with that um, and you'll find the playlist there. And if you want to message in, the number is in the bottom corner of the screen. It's 07520 632 392. Rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? But do text us in if you feel God's laying something on your heart. It could be a scripture, a prayer, um, a prophecy, a word. Uh, we want to all be a part of this and be engaged. And we can use our spiritual gifts uh, even if we're not in the same room, can't we? So relax, let loose. Uh, worship like there's no one watching. Um, well, there's one person watching, isn't there? Um, and maybe the dog as well. But just uh, go for it this morning. But as we, as we come to worship, I want to ask, how, how are you this morning? Um, or, or to ask a question that Wesley and the early Methodists used, how is it with your soul? A deeper question. And maybe in the chaos of this week, you think, actually, I don't really have an answer to that. I don't know. Or, or maybe you're thinking, actually, I've had a bit more time this week to reflect on that, and I'm starting to discover things. But Jesus says to you this morning, come as you are, wherever you are. And, and as we encounter him, we won't stay as we are. But his invitation to us is, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I'll give you rest. Rest from anxiety, rest from stress, rest from heartache and despair, maybe. Uh, rest from the everyday things of life and come and encounter me this morning. So I want to invite you where you are. You might want to put your hands out in front of you this morning. You might want to close your eyes, um, but some sign of saying, God, I want to meet with you and I'm going to pray for us and then hand over to Ian who's going to lead us in worship. So Father, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit this morning and I pray you would meet with each one of us. God, thank you that you invite us to come as we are. And we ask that you'd have your way this morning. We ask that you would aid our technology to work well. Um, but Lord, so that our hearts can be focused on Jesus. Amen. Hi, good morning. Welcome to our very own live lounge. We are looking forward just to spending some time together and worshipping God. And uh, it's obviously very different to what we're used to, but as Mark said, we really encourage you just wherever you are, just to worship God in the place that you're at. And uh, this is an opportunity, especially if you're on your own, just to go wild in your worship. Yeah, there's no, no one watching you, as Mark said, other than God. But... Uh, yeah, just, just let loose this morning and let's just lift our voices and worship him. As I was thinking about this morning, one of the things that uh, struck me was that instead of meeting together in one place, where maybe we're together and you know, shining a, a bright light for Jesus in the place that we meet, we're actually scattered all over the place. So there's loads of little lights that are actually shining for him as we come together and worship. And that's just a really powerful thing as we worship him within our community. Just want to read a couple of words to you from Romans, Romans chapter 8. It says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? And you could add in there coronavirus as well. As it's written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The words for the songs we're singing this morning should um, be 
in a PDF that's the link should be just below where you're where you're watching us on the uh, live link now hopefully so uh, if you have a look there you should see some words but hopefully you'll know most of the words for these songs anyway Thank you this morning that we can meet together with you even though we're apart. Lord, you join us all together with your love. Father, thank you for that great love that never fails. Lord, that love that never gives up on us. Lord, that love that is constant through the trials and the change that we go through. Thank you, Lord, that you're always there for us. And thank you, Lord, even in these difficult times, Lord, you're still that great and mighty God. You're that powerful God. You're the God that saves. Father, we thank you for that. Amen.
places and maybe you're in your garden, maybe you're in your living room. Uh, We come together as a family and, uh, you know, we meet together and and as we gather, two or three of us gather together, even virtually, uh, we can offer up our prayers together. And I encourage you now to do that exactly where you are. It's just offer up your prayers to God. And particularly thinking about that song. Heal our land. Heal our nation. So just lift up your voice now where you are and and give God the glory and pray for that healing. Let's do that together. Father, we just lift. Father, we do lift you up indeed. And on this national day of prayer, we say, Lord, heal our nation. As we read the news about how coronavirus is is spreading, Lord, we also want the good news of your, your grace to spread too. So, Father, equip us in our homes and in what we're doing to still be able to spread your love and do your work. Bless our families as it may get stressful at times being together for long periods of time, Lord. I pray for our families. Unite us like we haven't been united before. As a church family, connect us together in new ways. In Ashford, bring together the churches as we work to respond to this as a community.
keep those safe for those people that are in the NHS, in supermarkets, and protect them, Lord. And in the world, Lord, we lift up the other countries to you. May your light be seen and your love be shared there too and healing begin. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm just going to take one more song before I hand over to Mark. And this is just really a song that speaks about going into the unknown. And uh, these are certainly unknown times for us at the moment. And times when we really need to just to stay close to God and to trust in him. Stronger 
in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. And I will call upon your name. Keep my eyes above the way. So I rest in your embrace, for I am yours, and you are mine. We've got a message in here from, uh, from one of our church members, uh, and, uh, and they say this. They say, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. From Zechariah 14.9, what a scripture. And the prayer reads, thank you, Jesus, that you are Lord and that you are king over the whole earth. We pray for protection and blessing over our communities at this time and for all those who are finding things anxious. Please be their comfort and bring them peace. And, uh, and Sam Houghton's also uh, messaged in to say he's watching from Chelmsford and, and I'm sure there'll be many others um, university students who'll be connecting in with this today. Um, but if you do message in um, to the number in the bottom corner of the screen, then... Please also put who you are so that we can know, or don't if you want to remain anonymous. I'm sure there'll be more messages later on. Um, but we are coming to, uh, we're coming to read from Micah this morning, Micah chapter 6. And, um, and hopefully many of you have seen also about the online activities that are happening this week. Uh, for more information, check out our Facebook page or our website, www.willsboroughbaptist.church. We'll be posting up lots of things there about what we're doing in the week online, of course. And, um, and also feel free to email us or even give us a call. We have that technology too. So uh, please do get in touch. But as I say, we're going to read from Micah, a book in the Old Testament. Um, it's towards the end of the Old Testament, so just after Jonah. Uh, if you get to Matthew, you've gone a bit too far. So I'll give you an opportunity to turn there. And we're going to go to chapter 6, and we're reading from verses 6 to 8. That's Micah 6, verses 6 to 8. Micah says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. We've had a, a crazy week, haven't we? And if you're like me, you've probably been following all of those news headlines, pinging through and notifications on your mobile phone, maybe reading um, friends posting news uh, articles with varying reliability on social media, uh, changing all the time, or, or watching Boris's daily announcements that we've been getting. EastEnders may have been cancelled, but there's certainly still plenty of drama. And it's a concerning time for many. No one knows exactly what's going to happen. What's it going to mean for, for my family? What's it going to mean for our communities? What's it going to mean for my, my health? How long is it going to last? 
We've gone from washing our hands to, to self-isolating. Um, we've gone to having the kids at home, perhaps, for those with children. And each day it's been changing. We've seen panic buying in the supermarkets and empty shelves. And, and I don't know when the last time you saw an aeroplane up in the sky was, but it's, it's been a while for me. Life has changed, and, um, and it may be different for some time. And yet we worship the God of ages. You know, the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if you put your trust in him, then you have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Our lives are hid with Christ in God. However, that does not mean we just uh, put our heads down and carry on the same in a time such as this. It doesn't mean we act as if nothing is happening. It doesn't even mean we just shut ourselves away and pray, although prayer is absolutely essential as a time like this. And, and as we said earlier, today's a national day of prayer and Christians up and down the country are praying and we've got a prayer broadcast later on at 7 p.m. that's going to be available via our website that's coming to you from Baptists Together, the whole family of Baptist churches. But I think we need to have a three-way vision as God's people. I think a three-way vision is essential. So as we look out to a hurting world, um, to a world that is in pain and that is uncertain and that is experiencing suffering, we as the people of God look up. We look up to the God in, in whom we have help. He is where our help comes from. And as we do that, we're called to look in. We're called to look in at ourselves and our hearts and think, what needs to change within us? What is God asking us to do in this new season? Michael was a prophet. Uh, people didn't like prophets much. They didn't get many invitations to come around for dinner. Uh, people certainly socially distanced themselves from the prophets. In fact, many of the prophets ended up being killed in all kinds of gruesome ways. And... Um, and, and yeah, they, they were, I guess they were kind of like the artists of their day. Their work greatly appreciated in value after their death. But while they were around, people found it a bit distasteful. And the job of the prophet was to speak on God's behalf. Uh, they were called to speak tough messages, to express God's heart to people, to call people to turn back to God, calling the people of God to be the people God had called them to be all along. And when we look at the Bible, the challenge that the prophets gave um, for the vast majority of the time was always directed at God's people. And so the prophetic challenge is definitely very much for us, for those of us who put our faith in Jesus. Because when God's people live up to their calling, then the world is changed. So we're called to look at our hearts. We look to a world that is groaning. Uh, and Paul says in Romans 8 that our hearts groan too. And as they do, God births something new in us. He does a new thing in his people that is for the benefit of the world. Uh, sometimes I think we're like hardened vessels that we need to be broken open in order for God's blessing to be poured out. Michael was a farmer. He was from an ordinary family. He looked out of the world and he had a heart for ordinary people. And he could see that they were hurting. He could see that many at the time were being exploited. He could see corruption in the courts. He could see Huge issues for the people of Israel. And I mean, the issues were huge. For a start, the kingdom was divided. It was divided into the northern and southern kingdom, literally split in two because of political differences. Does that sound familiar to anybody? But these internal struggles were the least of their problems because they were facing threats from outside. The, the Assyrian Empire was gaining power and influence. And, and Micah said to them, that the capitals of this northern and southern kingdom, Samaria and Jerusalem, were going to be destroyed. But worse still, the hearts of the people had turned from God. They were chasing after idols and false gods. They were running after all kinds of other things. So everything's a bit of a mess. And at the beginning of the chapter, the verses we read, everything comes to a head and there's this kind of legal showdown. Uh, God versus the people, the people of God versus God. And, and it's hard to find a jury in a trial such as this. So God calls upon the mountains to bear witness. Literally, the foundations of the earth are to hear the charge God brings against his people. And God lays out to them the fact that he has been faithful through the ages. He has always stepped in to save his people. And yet the people have disregarded him. And then there's this turning point. 
the question of verse six that we read, with, with what shall I come before the Lord then? With what shall I bow down before the exalted God? And I think there's this point for all of us in our lives when we realize the fragility of our life, maybe the futility of our ways a lot of the time, the fact that we're not in control, even though we would really want to be, that we don't have everything together as much as we put out to the world that we do. And we realize we need God. We desperately need him. We need to connect with him. We need to be right with him. What shall I bring before him? With what shall I come before him then? And actually, this is the wrong question. You know, as the writer goes through several options, it gets even more ridiculous. And actually, it gets dark and sinister even. What about burnt offerings? What about calves a year old? No, do you know what? That's not good enough. I've sinned too greatly. What about a thousand rams? Maybe 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Uh, I'm so desperate. My sin's so great. Maybe I should offer up my firstborn. You know, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. And this isn't just exaggerated language here. There were nations and tribes and peoples who sacrificed children at this time in history. And God forbade it. He said he detested it. It's dark and sinister. And I'm sure we all agree on that one. But human religion can get twisted at times when people lose sight of who God really is. Or when people start to think, I have something I can bring to God. And actually, we have nothing we can bring to him. When people start to think, you know, if I have enough money, I can, I can buy my way out of trouble or, or maybe I can do ridiculous gestures that will, you know, surely do as if God calls for gestures from us. So I say, God doesn't need anything we have. Let me tell you a, a true story about a man named Charles Obong. He was a senior civil servant in Uganda Uh, He died aged 52, and in his will, he said he wanted to be buried with huge amounts of money in his coffin in order to bribe God. It's a true story. He was buried with 200 million Ugandan shillings, about 50,000 pounds, in order to redeem his soul before God. He said so that his sins would be forgiven and he would avoid hell. And he'd worked in the public service ministry, which became engulfed in a pension scandal And it cost the government about 257 billion Ugandan shillings. And the money, it turned out, was stolen by senior government officials. So his coffin was exhumed and the money was taken out. An Anglican priest, Joel Agel Awio, said, The price for eternal life is the blood of Jesus. If you want your sins to be forgiven, do it while you're still alive. It's a good message. But it's amazing the things people will try and exchange. I heard recently that um, there was a person with five bags of pasta and three toilet rolls and they wanted to exchange it for a five-bedroomed house with a swimming pool. And people said, that's ridiculous. There's no way you could have five bags of pasta. But the greatest exchange is the exchange God has already made on our behalf. God gave his son Jesus. I mean, what an exchange. His one and only son. He gave everything so that for us, by trusting in him, in his death, and his resurrection, we could have life. God loves us that much. With what shall I come before God is the wrong question. We cannot bring anything to him that he doesn't already have. God wants us. That's why he sent Jesus. We couldn't buy our way out of trouble any more than that guy in the story, Charles Obong. But Jesus paid the ultimate price to secure our eternal life. He laid down his life. He took our sin upon himself. He removed our guilt and shame. God gave his firstborn, his one and only son for our transgressions. For the sin of our soul, God gave his son. And that changes everything. Micah says in verse 8, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And now for Micah's first hearers, they'd seen what was good in the law. You know, they they had it written down, God's ways that have been given to them, this precious word of God for them. And for us, we see the fullness of what is good in Jesus. You know, Jesus is God made flesh. He is the embodiment of everything that is good. He is God's ultimate self-disclosure. Yes, God, you have shown us what is good. But there's still a key question in the light of this. And verse 8 goes on to say, And what does the Lord require of you? 
What does the Lord require of me and of us? And I think this is the key question for us. In our times, in our day, in this moment for us, as a church and as a nation, it's a significant moment. It's an opportunity for us as God's people to be the light and the life and the light that we are called to be. Um, to share Jesus with others, to shine brightly for him and be bringers of hope and serve our community in a time of need. Giving up what we have for others. And it's an opportunity for many to turn to Jesus. You know, I'm sure you're thinking many people are stuck behind closed doors. But believe me, God is already working by the power of his Holy Spirit in so many people's hearts and lives at a time such as this. God is breaking in and he calls us to see what he's doing, to pray into it, and to be a part of it in whatever way we can. And so we need to ask ourselves, okay, Lord, you know, we've looked upon this situation. We looked upon this world. Our hearts are burning. We are looking to you and we're trusting in you to do what only you can do. And, and we're asking, God, what do you require of us then? What does the Lord require of me? And the answer in Micah 6 verse 8 rings out with power. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It's a well-known verse. You know, not only in Christian circles, it's been quoted in presidential speeches. It's been plastered on bumper stickers. It's put on t-shirts. I literally have the t-shirt. But the answer is, has this message resonated? Has it impacted the depths of my heart? So, Here's the practical part, three points. That's what we like. And, and I'm sure you can guess what the three questions are. You know, Ian, do you fancy a guess at this point? You want to? Um, yeah, I'll just wait for the camera to swing <laughs> around. I'll give you my unprompted response. Um, to act justly. That's good. That's number one. To love mercy. Yep, that's number two. What about walking humbly? That sounds like a great yeah. idea to me. Yeah, brilliant. So first... Acting justly. You know, Micah lived in a world that was filled with injustice. Uh, he spoke of traders with dishonest scales. They were trying to fleece people. And, um, you know, it's a bit like people buying up hand sanitizer and trying to sell it for an exorbitant price online, isn't it? He spoke of people exploiting others and abusing the power they had been given of greedy people storing up for themselves. You read on in the verses, you'll see, uh, while others had very little and poverty was a great problem in Micah's day. You know, I, I heard this story recently that it was a quiet Monday morning in September 2053 when John awoke with a need to go to the bathroom. And, and for John, this was no ordinary day. This was the day he'd opened the last packet of toilet rolls his parents had bought in 2020. But do we stop to think about the impact our actions have on others? Do we consider the position of those less fortunate than ourselves? Those who don't have money just to go and fill a shopping trolley, who can't go shopping whenever they want. They might have to wait till payday or they might be NHS workers who we've read about recently. You know, unable to shop at other times and finding empty shelves. Or maybe it's those in other nations, actually, who really pay the price of our overloaded shopping trolleys. But, you know, this isn't a rant about overzealous shopping. You know, we need to be those who bring peace to those who are panicking, not persecution. And acting justly isn't just pondering about justice. It's not, it's not advocating for justice even, although we are called to do that too. It's not sharing a Facebook meme about justice. The Hebrew word could be translated do justice. It's about what we actually do in our lives when the rubber hits the road. How are we acting? You know, on one hand, we certainly shouldn't be the perpetrators of any kind of injustice. You know, maybe unfairly treating others, just being harsh. Actually, sometimes it's those who are closest to us who we can be most unjust to. The ones that we love, who bear the brunt of our injustice. Maybe it's abusing power that we have been given over other people and exploiting others. Or, or maybe it's, it's failing to fulfill um, the tasks that are required, to fulfill our obligations to others, uh, to somebody else. Skimping on work, for instance. You know, I guess no one's ever thought of that when they've been working from home, have they? 
But we should be concerned also about injustice and do everything in our power to redress the balance, to do justice. Many of us have more power than we think. We can certainly try to work in these times to ensure that everybody, including those in need, have food to eat. Those who are finding it hard to get supplies are provided for. Those who are worried about their jobs and their incomes are supported. And thankfully, there are many organizations and our government and people across our society who are seeking to fulfill that aim and to work towards justice at a time like this. And this brings us on to the second instruction, love mercy. You know, this is at the center for a reason. It's key for us in this time. Everyone needs mercy. We need it every day. And the Bible tells us that God's mercy is new for us every morning. And and thank the Lord that it is because we surely need it. Sometimes our mercy runs short, doesn't it? You know, it runs out and we don't top it up for some time. But God's mercy towards us is always overflowing. And when fear and panic and suffering are widespread in our society, mercy needs to be spread even more. We need to be merciful in the small, everyday things. You know, when those people push in front of us in, to get that last bag of rice, we need to show mercy. But we're not just called to be merciful, but to love mercy. Act justly, do justice, but love mercy. God himself is certainly a God of justice. He is fair. He does what is right, but he loves mercy. The Hebrew word for mercy here is hesed. It can be translated loving kindness. Uh, And this kind of mercy is kind. It is is extravagant. It's consistent. And our God is kind. He is compassionate. I heard it once said that everything God does in the world is motivated by a heart of compassion. Compassion is the driving force of all of God's activity in the world. It is the impulse of God's mission. And so the same should be true of us, shouldn't it? That everything we do should be motivated by compassion and a love for God. And, you know, you become what you love, don't you? So if we love mercy, we will become merciful, compassionate, kind people as we follow Jesus. And it doesn't come naturally, but it comes from discovering God's heart. So how can we do this? Well, we can be kind with our words, can't we? Our words are important. They, they, they carry power. We need to spread kindness with the things that we say. And that includes things we post on Facebook, perhaps. Uh, we need to go out of our way to speak a kind word to someone who really needs it. And there are so many people in need of encouragement right now. You know, 111 phone operators need our encouragement. People working in supermarkets, doctors and nurses, MPs, teachers, uh, people across society need kind words more than ever, but also kind actions. A friend of mine recently shared how he went to the supermarket and he remembered reading um, in an article by one of the CEOs of the supermarkets that all their people were working incredibly hard. And he said, please uh, try and show some appreciation. So as he came up to the queue for, uh, for the checkout, he saw a cream egg and he thought, I'm going to buy that. And he went and he gave it to the checkout assistant and it prompted a great conversation. But kindness changes the atmosphere. You know, a small act of kindness can change the entire course of someone's day, maybe even their week. Who knows the knock-on impact that our acts of kindness can have? And we have many opportunities to be kind. When you go shopping, you get that last packet of chicken or or bag of chips or whatever it might be. How about giving that away to somebody else? Or maybe um, going and dropping gifts on the doorsteps of your neighbours, especially those who might be self-isolating at this time. Wear gloves as you do it. You don't want to give them an unwanted gift. But we need to spread kindness, don't we? And pray for others. Offer to pray for people who are fearful at this time, bless others with the peace of God. And there are other big acts of kindness and compassion that we can engage in together. So one of the leadership team uh, last week came in with two big boxes of food that they had got ready for those who were in need. 
Uh, and people are going out tomorrow morning to drop leaflets through people's doors to let them know that we are here to help in times such as this in whatever way we possibly can. One of the church members dropped off two freezers yesterday to the church so that we are ready to be able to provide meals for people who need them. And we still need more freezers. We want as many freezers as we can get. Um, but there are many ways we can be kind and compassionate. And compassion, mercy, kindness... It's what will change the atmosphere because it brings joy into people's lives. And actually, do you know what? When the door, door is open to joy in someone's life, then usually that's one step removed from their heart being open to Jesus. Finally, walk humbly with your God. And you know, actually, there's no other way to walk with God, is there? You know, God is magnificent. How can I possibly walk alongside him apart from in humility? And humility isn't about beating yourself up. You know, that's false humility. Someone once said, humility isn't about thinking less of yourself. It's about thinking of yourself less. And humility means listening to others. We draw alongside people. We are slow to speak. Um, we want to meet people where they're at. And walking humbly at this time means we admit we don't know the answers. But we walk alongside the one who does, and we look to him, and we're led by him. And, and as we walk with him, we go deeper in relationship with him, which is possibly the most important thing we can do at this time, going deeper in prayer, in worship, in our own spiritual life, so that God can transform us from the inside out to be uh, the people, the good news people that we need to be in our world. And it has to be emphasized because if we're not walking with him, then we've missed the point. We've got to be in relationship with God. And God calls us to see what he is about to do in our world and to be involved. And I believe he's going to do something special in our communities and in our world at this time. So what does God require of us in this time we find ourselves in? To act justly, to do justice. To love mercy, loving kindness, mercy, compassion, acts of kindness to others, words of kindness. And to walk humbly with our God. And in all this, we have the greatest example in Jesus himself. The one who was always just. The one who loved to show mercy to others, to heal people, to reach out to those who no one else would even go near. Who loved to forgive sins. And he forgives our sins too, who loved mercy and who walked humbly with his father, who said, I only do what I see my father doing. If God himself can be humble, we certainly can be too. And you know the place where justice and mercy and humility meet is the cross. The place where Jesus took the sins of the world upon himself, where he dealt with them, where he did justice once and for all. The place where the mercy of God was revealed as God took our place, as God suffered on our behalf, as God did everything that was necessary for us to be forgiven from our sins and set free and released to live life to the full. And where Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death so that we could be lifted up to new life with him. And in this season, the most important thing you can do is trust in Jesus and what he has done for you and put your life in his hands because there is the place where your life is secure for all eternity. So let's walk now. Let's live this out. Let's act justly. Let's love mercy. Let's walk humbly with our God and let's impact the world around us for our King and our Lord. I want to invite you to pray with me now. I'm just going to invite you, actually, if you want, just to, again, ask God to come into your heart right now. Let's just pause for a moment and respond personally. And then I'll lead us in prayer. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. God, there's nothing we can give to you, but you've given us the most indescribable, wonderful, glorious gift of life in your Son. And there is no greater gift that we can receive but Jesus himself. 
And as we look out to a world that is hurting and broken right now, and Lord, as we look to you and we say, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. God, you've shown us what is good and you've told us what you require of us and help us to act justly at this time. Help us to love mercy and compassion and kindness. And Lord, help us to walk humbly with you. We want to go deeper in relationship with you. Holy Spirit, come and fill us now with that life of Jesus himself so that we can be like him, so that we can become more like him and so that we can impact our community and bring your peace and your life even in the midst of despair and anxiety. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to pass back to Ian now, who's going to lead us in a song as we respond to that. In thinking about how good God is, you know, it says in his word that all good things come from him. And when there are things going on that maybe aren't as good, it's, it's good to focus on those good things that do come into our lives and just to be thankful for God for them. This morning when I woke up, um, our dog was like a dog on a hot tin roof and um, was manically looking for a walk. So I took her out for a walk we went around the field. I took a ball with us. She lost it. Um, and then she decided to roll in the biggest pile of fox poo you've ever seen. And um, things weren't going that well. I w must admit, I wasn't um, the most patient dog owner at that time. And then we met Christine. Christine Ross. And I don't know if you noticed the smell or not, but she stopped to chat anyway. And um, we had quite a good conversation, just talked about how nice the day was, how it was good that spring was coming. And that just really lifted my spirits. And I think it's experiences like that when we get something good that comes into our life that we really need to look to God and say, God, thank you so much for that because these good things come from you. So we're just going to take this song as we close our time together this morning and sing of the good, good Father that we have. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. You 
are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Love so undeniable, I, I can hardly speak peace so unexplainable I I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love love Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Father, we thank you for the time that we've been able to spend together, even though that we've been wide apart. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. And I just pray that you would just equip us for the days and the weeks that lie ahead. Lord, that you would give us your strength. Lord, that you would help us to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. Father, we just give these coming days into your hands. Lord, we ask that you would use us in whatever way you choose. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Amen. Amen. And just as we close, um, we've been a bit slow to get these texts through this morning, um, but I just want to end with this, um, this verse that's been messaged in from Isaiah 40, verse 31. It says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So may God bless you with his strength. May he cause you to rise on wings like eagle. May he cause you to soar above all of the problems of this world. And may he cause you to be the justice, the mercy, and the humility, the peace of Jesus, wherever he's placed you. Amen. Please continue to connect in with us in the week uh, via our website, via our Facebook page. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we'll be posting up more of the messages that have come through uh, later on on our Facebook page too. Um, but we, we thank you for being a part, for worshipping us this morning. May God bless you. May you have a wonderful day.